And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer into the temple. One one part of the cr the motley crew of the Phoenix Press. That is the Phoenix Press, not Phoenix Press. You know, it's like a tribe called Quest. You say the whole thing. And creator of Twenty One Hundred Samurai, which is currently going through currently crowdfunding its second issue on Indiegogo. The one and only Nick Gibson. How you doing today, man? Thank you, thank you. And I must say, I love what you've done the place. The whole <laughs> temple chic thing you got going on here. It's quite mm -hmm. lovely. Yeah. For whatever reason, some people run out at the smell of incense. I don't know why. Incense smells lovely. It's very mm -hmm. relaxing. Uh, that or that or they that or they're in shock about the idea of a monk drinking. But but monks in Europe brew beer, like really good beer, actually, from what I hear. Both Europe and in Tibet, from what I've heard. Yeah, like Belgian uh, monk beer is supposedly like some of the best beer you can get. Mm -hmm. And well, when you're, when you're when you're in a t when you're in a monastery away away from most of civilization, you pick up hobbies because you yeah. get. Yeah, it's like oh, uh, we can't get booze. Fine, we'll make it ourselves. We mm -hmm. got enough yeast. Yeah. So I'd like to start at the humble beginnings. Um, how did you how did you first get into comics? Were you more were you a Marvel guy? Were you a DC guy growing up? Were you were you a indie guy? I'd say DC for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I loved my my Batman, my Teen Titans, Nightwing's a favorite of mine. Um, I did read some Marvel like uh, Daredevil and a lot of the uh, some of the X Men related stuff, and uh, weirdly enough, a bit of Silver Surfer. That's a name I don't hear all that often, because a lot of times when people bring up Silver Surfer, it's tangential to something else, usually Fantastic Four. Yeah. Yeah, he's uh he's he's got a he's a really interesting character. Um you know, I mean it's it's what I like about him, it's like he's got like this absolutely batshit insane premise that only could come out of the sixties. It's a silver guy who surfs the cosmos on a surfboard that can only come out of an acid trip from the '60s, and I freaking love it. Mm -hmm. Um, since you mentioned teen, since you mentioned Teen Titans, I'm guessing, I'm guessing you got, I'm guessing you got started with the new Teen Titans era. Um, yeah, the Mark Wolfman George Perez run. That is correct. Um, which. And I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure at some point, I'm pretty sure at some point, if I dug around enough with some of the comics you had, I'd see John Byrne's name. But that's not saying much because John Byrne was everywhere. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's been everywhere, man. Mm -hmm. Um, right, right alongside, right alongside Chris Claremont, just go through their bibliography and and I'll see you in a week. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like a six degrees of Kevin Bacon kind of thing. Oh. Chuck Sonnenberg, aka SF Debris, decided to see if he could make if he could have Superman beat Kevin Bacon at his own game. Uh, well, that's a tall order. Yeah, see if you can if you can trace anything back to to Superman in five steps or less. Seeing how much stuff Superman's been in, it shouldn't be too hard. Especially uh, when you got like the crossovers, like uh, Justice League versus. Uh, Avengers and also Teen Titans versus X Men. You know that that's a big bridge. Well, <laughs> let me give one example from that. Twenty four. Like the Jack ba the, the like the Jack Bauer thing. Yep. Okay, uh, you have you had my curiosity. Now you have my interest. Twenty four starred Kiefer Sutherland. Kiefer Sutherland was what was at one point in consideration to play Robin in Batman and Robin. Really? Rob, Robin is the Robin is the sidekick of Batman. <laughs> Batman is on the Justice League. Superman is on the Justice League. Okay, uh, I'm gonna come up with one, one right now. One, one right now myself. Uh, Steve, uh, 
uh, what's what's it? Uh, um, what's the lead singer of Aerosmith's name? Uh, Steven Tyler. Steven Tyler. Okay, Steven Tyler had a daughter named Liv Tyler, who was in Lord of the Rings. You know who else was in Lord of the Rings? Um, uh, Ian McKellen, who played Magneto in X Men. Uh, the X Men crossover Teen Titans, uh, and then who was on the, in that? Robin, Batman, Superman. <laughs> See, <laughs> and of course, of course, there was the meme version of egg whisks. Egg whisks are used to make cakes. Lex Luthor stole forty cakes. That's as many as four tens, and that's See, terrible. Is, see, the problem is you, you got shaky foundation because the cake is a lie. Yeah, and the pot. Yeah, but the pie is a fake. But then what? Then what? Then what's on my face? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I'm loving this. I'm I'm loving this. Riff um, we're doing it. Too. Yeah. The, I remember the. I remember back in the mid 2000s, there was a game show called Distraction that. Would do would have interesting ways to buzz in, one of which was instead of pre instead of pressing a button, you pressed a lever that would um, pie you in the face with something of with a pie a pie tin filled with random stuff. Sometimes you might get whipped cream. Sometimes you might get oatmeal. Sometimes you might get um, seeds. Um, sometimes you might get honey. So this is one of those things where you're hoping for whipped cream. Yeah. It's certainly not going to feel good washing all that stuff off. But when it comes, but with that in mind, to get back into saner things, um, the when it comes to when it comes to um. When it comes to the whole, D when it comes to the DC angle, which I I get the feeling was a significant influence on how you pre how you present things. Um, uh, when it comes to me the mechanics of comics, yeah, mm -hmm. I also draw a lot of influences from like movies, TV shows, especially music. Like music is definitely a big uh, way I write because I write kind of with like rhythm and like uh, you know like how things kind of flow and like how you know the hits, the peaks, and the valleys. Mm-hmm. But yeah, DC is definitely an influence on me. And with that in mind, what I'd be what I'd be curious about is how is how something like Twenty One Hundred Samurai even came to be. This idea of a of doing a samurai themed version of the of the Man Out of Time motif. Well, it, it, it uh, basically kind of was gestated in, in kind of the latter years of my, my high school days. So we're talking like, you know, 2005, 2006. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I was very much obsessed with The Matrix. Like, I'd watch it over and over and over again to the point where, like, I just like, analyzed the fight scenes and whatnot. And then. I hope to God you didn't do that with the sequels. The sequels had some good action scenes, but it was a lot, a lot with the first film. Um, but yeah, and then also films like The Last Samurai with Tom Cruise mm -hmm. were kind of popular around the time. And then also stuff like Ghost in the Shell were kind of big in, in, in my kind of sphere. So I kind of just took all my favorite things and kind of mashed it up and, uh, that's what came out. Well, the tricky whip, the tricky part with Ghost in the Shell that I have to ask is which Ghost in the Shell? Uh, it's it's a combination of the first movie and then the first season standalone complex. That's kind of what I that's kind of what I figured. Um, you got to remember, this is like early, like like mid two thousands. I'm creating this, so it's like you got to remember what was available at the time, which was like mm -hmm. the first two movies, and then standalone complex, and then second gig. Well, the the manga was of it. The manga was available, but the big that reason I bring the big reason I bring that up is each. With with a few with a few exceptions, each ver each version of adapting Ghost in the Shell has been different. And mm -hmm. um, someone once asked Shiro Masamune what he considers the definitive one, and he said he doesn't cons he doesn't consider any of them the definitive one. In his mind, each of them is t is um 
optimized for a specific experience. And honestly, that kind of ties in with the ethos of Ghost in the Shell, the whole modability, adaptability, you know, the whole change aspect that's, like, baked into the DNA of the show. So it just kind of works really well, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Unless you're doing a live action version with Scarlett Johansson, which is like gross, which is basically just Ghost in the Shell greatest hits. If I'm being a, if I'm being honest, doing the idea of doing a live action Ghost in the Shell was not the problem. And the, the movie prob- itself wasn't terrible. Like I'm going to be honest with you, it wasn't terrible. Sorry, go ahead. The problem was it was done too late. Yeah, like it should have been done like 2007, 2008. Starring Mila Jokovic. I mean, honestly, if you had my, if you, if it was my opinion, I just put Mila Jokovic in everything. Oh. Um, so. And to be to be fair, around that around that time, you did have her in Ultraviolet, which. Oh my very, god! I love that. that which that, yeah, that I love that movie. Very much was taking its cues from Japanese cyberpunk to the point where it got a madhouse. Um, anime, which I haven't seen because whoa, I haven't. Whoa, been... whoa, 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 whoa! There's a mat. There's an uh, ultraviolet madhouse anime. Yeah, the only <laughs> trouble. Just the only tr- the only trouble is the fact that I haven't found anybody to to do fan translation, and I don't think it ever got an official release. So See, that makes me really mad because, like, I like ultraviolet. Like, is it campy as hell? Yes. Do I love it? Also, yes. And I just. It, it, like that's one of those things where it it could created this amazing world that you wanted more stories in, and what's really a kind of a kind of a tease is they show the comic book in the first one. Like this, like if I could license any property to do like a stories in, it would be ultraviolet. Like seriously, yeah. I would love to do that. Um, I know that the Max Payne two modders had some fun with that by integrating it with the Hall of Mirrors mod, Ooh. which was very popular around the time, and mm-hmm. it's. And it still it still is fairly popular, but the thing, the interesting thing, the interesting thing about bringing that about bringing that kind of thing up is, Kurt Wimmer, the director of that, and also the director of Equilibrium, yeah. is somebody who pays an extreme amount of attention to how he handles fight scenes. You can tell, like if you watch Equilibrium and Walter Violet, there is a bit of a. A, sh- a kind of a shared, I I I don't want to use this word again, but it's the only word I think of DNA. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but yeah, there's kind of a shared DNA between the films. You can tell they belong to the same creative outlet, whatever. Yeah, but the uh, the other th- given given that given that and given the whole the the. I want to focus a little bit more on the co- on the concept of the man out of time, which. If you bring that kind of thing up, a lot of people will bring up Captain America. Has that gotten brought exactly. up to you when when ta- when giving the elevator pitch for Twenty One Hundred Samurai? Absolutely, that other people have brought it up more than I've brought it up myself as a kind of a shorthand to kind of explain the concept. Mm-hmm. And it's which does bring uh, obviously besides besides just fanboyism of stuff or, stuff from that era. Um, what made you go with samurai as far as the as far as the displacement? Well, obviously, love for samurai aside, I'd say um, just kind of like like I'm not strictly doing like oh he's following Bushido. It's more mm-hmm. just a general kind of code of honor. Like at the risk of sounding stupid, it's more he's yeah, I'm kind of treating him more like a European. Knight, like not even chivalry, but just honorable warrior kind of stuff. You know, just I don't know, just and plus, and plus, it's just kind of like the the, the like the contrast of you have all these cyberpunk clothing, and then you just have a guy walk around in samurai armor, and it's just mm-hmm. it's kind of one of those like on the surface level, it seems completely ridiculous, but like I, I try to play it straight, and it's just. I don't know, it's just kind of an interesting visual, honestly, almost. Yeah, and um, given given some of the other um, backgrounds and the like, I'm also I'm also curious if um, if you had grown up watching Batman Beyond. The answer to that is a very empathetic yes. I had sus- I had suspected. Don't 
it's it wasn't anything outright obvious that gave that suspicion. Batman and Beyond is definitely a very strong influence on this comic. Mm-hmm. And the other, the other thing, the other thing that I w- that I could that I couldn't help but I couldn't help but notice. And yet, and looking back at it, yeah, I should I should have noticed that you outright listed um, Batman Beyond. Um, is well, given that you mentioned that this idea is something that came to mind when you were in high school, what were you? Was this something that was in the back of your mind for a long time, just refining it with, it from time to time? Partially, no. I mean, I've always kind of a creator. I've always kind of been drawing samurais. I mean, honestly, uh, this idea has evolved drastically over time. Like in the beginning, I had planned to give him like a like a polymer suit. One second, this is mm-hmm. what you get when you have the window open. Um, one second I had planned to give him a polymer suit, kind of, you know, kind of like, you know, kind of thing. Um, Mm -hmm. and that was going to be like in the first issue. Um, and then, uh, probably about a few years back when I kind of revisited the scripts and rewrote them, a kind of a fun fact is issue one, I only really adapted the first half of it. And then with issue, in issue two is basically an amalgamation of, the second half of, of issue one, and what I had planned for issue two. So there's a lot of like combining. There's a lot of stuff, and then when I went to do this comic, and I did issue one, I kind of made the realization of like, okay, you spend all this time setting up this character in this kind of suit. It, you I mean you could put him in something different, but it would probably be better for continuity if you kept him in the same suit. So. Um, I decided to ditch the polymer suit idea and kind of just keep him in his armor. Like, at some point, he'll have a more casual outfit, but anytime he knows he's going into battle, he'll be wearing his armor. Mm-hmm. And what, what prompted the, what prompted the need to split issue one like that? Was it, ju- was it just a funding thing, or was it, um... It was kind of a judgment call on length because I was as I was adapting the issue, as I was writing it, because the, the problem with the script for issue one uh, is when I wrote it, I really didn't know what I was doing, and so it was more of a narrative rather than like page panel kind of breakdown. Mm-hmm. And so when I was writing it, I got to a point where I was hitting page twenty, and I was trying to go for an average of like twenty to twenty four, which is more like American style page counts. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you know about comic printing. They're done in, in groups of in like multiple of four. Yeah, I've heard about that. Yeah, so I I had kind of reached page twenty, and it, I kind of had like a good end. You know, it's like some something happened, someone goes missing, and it was like a good cliffhanger ending. So I kind of made the decision. You know what? I'm already at page twenty. I got like the rest of the half of this book that I that I, like a whole chunk of it. Let's just cut it off here, and then I kind of mushed together, um, you know, like I said, for, for issue two, and came up pretty interesting, honestly. Mm-hmm. I'd say that, I'd say that certainly makes sense. Yeah, now, a little bit of, the original ending for issue one was gonna be, he was running out of the, because he actually snuck into the Star building, and revealed some stuff, and, then, like, he was stared down by, like, this giant robot, and, like, it was supposed to be, like, Oh, he's facing an enemy. Cut. You know, and then issue two takes place after that. But I kind of jettisoned that whole sequence because I realized him going to Ensnar on the first issue was kind of a bit too soon. Mm-hmm. And with with that with that in mind, since you since you earlier you had mentioned that you use. Um, music and ry- and rhythm to help to help with your writing. Given that, given that, I'm curious what sort of music you used as your, for lack of a better term, muse. It uh, well, if we're talking about what I listen to when I'm writing. It's hmm. usually either 
chill wave, retro wave, uh, maybe maybe some sort of like video game kind of wa- basically this type of synth wave synth wavy stuff. Basically, I like stuff that I, like that's in my head, but I can kind of tune out. Anything with lyrics in it kind of forces me to concentrate on it, and it makes it hard to focus on the book. Like I want kind of stuff in the background that that kind of goes into my head, like study music, if you will, mm-hmm. you know. Um, that, and then as far as um, like certain scenes, I I kind of like write like as if I'm scoring them to certain soundtracks, like either like a Star Wars Duel of Fates kind of thing, or more like a rocking kind of thing, like. When I'm mm-hmm. writing it, I'm kind of like imagining a score in my head, kind of like a do 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 do, you know, mm-hmm. kind of thing. Now, I can I can certainly I can certainly see that. And have there been have there been cases where ba- where trying to balance the that very stringent page count has resulted in a few things needing to get cut, needing to get um trimmed? Uh, yeah, I'd say that. Um, uh, I've more kind of run into the issue of dialogue rather than page count more than anything else. Cause like, um, obviously as a writer, you know, I want to write dialogue, but the thing is the kind of problem you run into is you you can't really, you can only have so much dialogue on a page before you're just writing a novel. And I kind of went a little bit too far with that on issue two. I mean, it's a kind of dial back. It, it works, but it's not the best. So that's kind of something I'm still still kind of struggling with and still working on is kind of just paring back my dialogue or being more compact with it. Um, so so yeah, it's kind of basically the, the issues I've been facing. Mm-hmm. So now you going from issue one to issue two as you are. What would you say? Have, what would you say have been some of the things that you've learned in the interim as far as put as far as putting something out because this is even though this is, this is technically your third campaign but this is the first time you've done a follow-up to something previous yeah and then uh i've had some some tribulations here this is this is kind of issue two is really the first time where i've had like a steady kind of thing from beginning to end um you know uh because the issue because uh issue one i had like some art artist shakeups. And then with issue two, the artist who finished issue one, I'm having him come back. Uh, basically, I say some of the challenges were like work, learning to work with people, kind of like, you know, like I want something done, but I, I, I don't, you know, I'm trying to be gracious about it, patience, and kind of just, you know, just kind of, I, I had to learn, like, yeah, it's your book, but it's not all about you. You know, they're doing, they're doing their job too. You know, just you, you know, just treating them like the human being they are, and and whatnot, you know, and yeah, I had a, there's a few kind of disagreements me and the artist had, but we, we made it, and uh, yeah, we're still working together, and it's great. Mm-hmm. And speaking of that, I'd, I'd be curious how you how you met up with the artist that you're working with, um, b- both Brian and Arvel. Uh, with Brian... Uh, he he was recommended to me by a friend. I deal with him mostly through through Fiverr. He's a South American mm-hmm. artist, so all our communication is done through messaging through Fiverr. And then as far as Arville Jones, uh, me and him we do a lot of the same local conventions together, and so that's kind of how we met and we kind of became ingratiated to each other. Uh, mm-hmm. So we kind of run in the same circles. All right, that that certainly makes sense, and. Given th- given that whole sets of four thing, what are you shooting for as far as the page count for issue two? With issue two, I I believe it's still in the twenty to twenty four range. I can't remember the exact number, but it's definitely within that range. Mm-hmm. And something else, something else, I'm cu- I'm curious about is. In reg- in regard to in regard to setting up the the ca- the cast of things as well as sin- since you since you brought since you mentioned her and since you mentioned her on the Kickstarter um, sorry not Kickstarter Indiegogo I keep making that mistake call it habits okay. um, yeah, I get it. um the introduction of Ty- of Tyler Schnee which yes is 
is the intent of Ty of Tyler in the in the story to be kind of I get I guess the not necessarily the audience surrogate but the but the information but the information um representative for lack of a better term yep yes um you know she's kind of there to be like a guide I mean she's gonna be set up to be like the partner mm -hmm. like uh he's eventually going to be trained to be a song or samurai in her own right so it's kind of like a like a Batman and Robin kind of situation and the way I've also kind of set it up is like they need each other mm -hmm. where like Kira was obviously very physical physically powerful but mm -hmm. he's not he's not used to the social currents of this world and he doesn't know how to navigate like the, the streets or whatever whereas Tyler is very street smart and so like you know they kind of help each other learn from each other kind of thing like they're not going to be romantic I'm just going to lay that gauntlet down now that's not really where I'm tending for them to go. I mean, there will be some romantic stuff with other characters, but not between Tyler and Kiro. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, with the, with that in with that in mind, one thing I definitely found interesting is that you're going for a bl a black and white, almost manga esque approach with yeah. the art. Um. Was that was was that a conscious choice or was it a practicality choice? Uh, this is gonna sound like a cop out, but it's a bit of column A, column B. Um, basically, the story is when I was doing issue one, uh, when I when I was going into it, my intention was to do color, mm -hmm. but I had a colorist drop out, and then I decided to make it black and white. And then the more I thought about it, the more I realized how it kind of worked. So I I eventually leaned into it, and so going into issue two. I decided I'm going to go black and white and kind of just, I just made it a black and white book. And it's, it's more of a, I didn't choose a choice, but I ended up liking it and just kind of leaning into it. You know, that's really the short of it. It's that certainly makes sense. Um, now I, I know I mentioned earlier what, what you had learned between issues, but, what I'm also curious about is what you th what you had learned as a writer between issues. Well, I def already mentioned the the dialogue mm -hmm. thing, so I guess that that one's out of the bag. Probably say as a writer, um, structure, kind of learning to write characters better. Obviously, kind of like deciding, kind of figuring out the personalities of the characters, like. Like, for example, with issue two, I really solidify um, Kiro as, like, a, you know, more of, like, a more headstrong person, like, very more, you know, upright kind of thing. Like, I want to do the right thing, you know, kind of, you know, mm -hmm. and like, he's not an idiot, but it's more of just, like, he's ignorant to the, like, he's, it's kind of one of those things where it's, like, because he's not, not, like, he's not up to speed on these times. He comes off like an idiot, but he's actually like reasonably intelligent. Like you know those kind of situations. Yeah. You know, so that's that's kind of where it comes from. Where it's like obviously he has different values. He's more you know more traditionally kind of heroic and upstanding, whereas Tyler is more of a pragmatist, slightly bitter or whatever streetwise, and it kind of mm -hmm. comes across. I'm going there right now, you know, kind of stuff. Yeah. And with that, with that in mind, whenever I see these kind of, whenever I see these kind of, du um, dual personality approaches, my mind always, com my mind always comes comes to Abbott and Costello in some form. Um, if only because that's what, even if it's not a comedy, that kind of, um, paired duo is what springs to mind for me. You know, one per one person who's the straight man, one person who isn't. To keep the to keep the to keep the anchor with these kind of things. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, it's it's a classic comedy trope. You have the crazy man and the straight man. Mm -hmm. And even though Twenty One Hundred Samurai obviously isn't a comedy, do you have a bit of that when it comes to writing your two characters to have to have that kind of dynamic? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, definitely in the terms of, like, Hero wants to do a thing, but Tyler has to rein him in, kind mm-hmm. of thing, like, I'm gonna do this thing, and Tyler's like, no, you can't do that, mm-hmm. you know, so, so yeah, there's definitely that, those kind of elements where Tyler is definitely the straight person in this mm-hmm. dynamic. Yeah. Now, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date, per se, but a, but a general window. Uh, for issue two, mm-hmm. um, I'm hoping to have these out within the net within a few months after the campaign ends. So as as it sits now, um, if I can get funded in the first thirty days, I'm gonna just put it in demand and then go from there. But if I have to, I'll go the extra thirty days and make sure I get funded. So uh, go from there. So right now, basically, if it gets funded. I'll probably start shipping it out late June, early July, but if I have to do another month, then we're probably then kind of push things back another month. So we're talking like late July, early August. Mm-hmm. And that's I, what I'm shooting for anyway. Yeah. And I will cert- I will certainly be looking forward to seeing what you are what you're able to conjure up when the time comes. Oh. And I. And I do I, I do appreciate that you ha- that you have certain um, reward tiers for the for those who didn't get issue one. Yeah, because like going into this, I, I like that was actually one of the first things I thought about because like you know because issue one the the Indiegogo got bungled a little bit, so I realized this will be the first time for I say most people that they're seeing Turn Samurai, so it's like I I, I need to put in these catch up tiers. For people, so that they can guarantee that they uh, they they have everything. Mm-hmm. And with all that in mind, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. My pleasure. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>